Last time, archaeologist Jonathan Reed gave us pause by naming three figures not named Jesus who were pivotal in shaping the New Testament. Today we're going to talk about Caesar Augustus, Herod the Great, and what doing as the Romans do has to do with the New Testament. And that's coming up right now. You'll recall that we have been taking a critical approach to thinking about the history of the New Testament, one that has us consider artifacts, text, and the social world that emanate from something called Hellenization. Hellenization was a program that involved Alexander the Great drawing territories from the city-states of Greece to Egypt to Asia Minor and places as far as India into his social political sphere of influence. While he died in 323 BCE, the cultural impact of this was felt well into the first century BCE. Things were similarly tumultuous further west on the Italian peninsula, home of the Roman Republic. It was growing eastward and westward, but it was also growing apart. A civil war that saw the Roman general Julius Caesar dissolve the Senate and take over the government until his assassination nearly broke the country apart. And if this sounds like the plot to Star Wars, you're not wrong. But wait, there's more. In 31 BCE, Julius Caesar's grandnephew and adopted son Octavian took control of the government. He declared himself an emperor, drawing upon the familial name Caesar. His plan was to bring about an era of peace and security called the Pax Romana. His method was two-pronged. One, he had a pretty fierce army to help keep people in line. And two, he talked a big game about the future that made people stay in line. He figured that if you promise people the world, they'll act right as long as you deliver. And he saw how the Greeks had delivered with Hellenism, so he adopted that program. Rome would be the imperial center, with Latin becoming the official language of the state. But Greek would remain the koine, or common tongue, of all of the colonies. The polis and its features would be expanded upon under the supervision of governors, who were in charge of Rome's military and political leadership outside of Rome. Caesar also used client kings or local rulers to carry out his will in exchange for authority. So governors were in charge of spreading political messaging on behalf of the emperor, while client kings collected taxes and kept the locals happy, all in tribute and for the good of the empire. This work led to some of the most amazing roadways and waterways known in the world. Its people were protected by the empire's legions. The architecture was a sight to behold. It's no wonder Washington DC was built to look like Rome. From England to the Middle East, this is what power looked like. And if you were part of it, you were cosmopolitan, a citizen of the world. Caesar Augustus, that is Caesar the Great, thus bore titles telling of his aspirations. In addition to being like Alexander the Great, he was known as Princeps, or Princeps, the first from which we get the word prince. Pontifex Maximus, the chief priest, though more literally the supreme bridge builder, a title used also by the Pope. Divi Filius, the divine son, or yes, son of God. You can already see how this might be in tension with the commonplaces of Christianity, but let's not get it twisted. Titles like Son of God were being used in Rome and Greece prior to the Jesus tradition. Hercules and Heracles, anyone? But rather than clutching the caretaker perspective of the New Testament's holy uniqueness, I want to challenge us to consider the New Testament as an extension of Romanization. Remember how we said Caesar Augustus would use client kings to carry out his will locally? The land of the Hasmoneans was one such place where this all went down. The Hasmoneans had been ruling themselves as an independent Jewish kingdom as a result of winning against the Seleucids. But as Rome moved eastward, Augustus appointed someone from a region just south who would be a loyal subject and do his bidding. This person was known as Herod of Idumea, but you know him as Herod the Great. And while his name undoubtedly will make some of y'all's blood boil, he played a pivotal part in this story. In fact, you know why he was called Great was because he carried out the work of making Jerusalem a polis. He took Solomon's temple, now dilapidated from colonial rule, and renovated it into a site to behold. He established other cities in the region, like the, po the port of Caesarea Maritima, that paid literal tribute to the emperor. Herod Archelaus ruled Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. Herod Antipas 
ruled Galilee and Perea. Herod Philip ruled Golanitis. And Salome, his daughter, ruled a coastal region called Jamnia or Yavne. All of these figures make an appearance in the New Testament, and their job was not only to keep the region's people in line, but to do as other client kings and governors did, to spread the good news of the Roman peace. The Herodians were not alone in this work. In the city of Pisidian Antioch in modern day Turkey, excavators found a massive wall that chronicles all of the, quote, good things done by the divine Augustus in the language of the state, that is Latin. This is called the Res Geste Divi Augusti. Now, one could call this a matter of state propaganda, and in formal terms, that's by no means wrong. In fact, the Gospel of John, chapter 19, especially verses 19 and 20, talk about a similar posting. In this case, the Roman governor Pontius Pilate, working with the local tetrarch, oversees the capital punishment of Jesus of Nazareth. The charge? Jesus doesn't deny being the Son of God, and is said to see himself as King of the Jews. In a word, treason. The crime is made clear not only in Jesus' public hanging, but in the sign posted atop the cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. We'd probably put that last piece in square quotes today to indicate the sort of irony, but Rome got the point across by putting this message in the official language of the Romans, the common language of the global city, that is, the cosmopolis, cosmopolis. It was also in Koine Greek, as well as the local language of the Hebrews. I'd like you to take a minute and read John 19 in light of Romanization. For what I think we begin to see is that the New Testament exists at the crux or crossroads of some social, cultural, and political changes that extend well beyond the proportions of the Bible as people see it. As we read the Gospels, pay special attention to the role of Jerusalem in the temple. It becomes the epicenter of a lot of conflict throughout its renovation by the Herodians, its administration by the priestly Judean establishment, and its destruction by the Romans in 70 CE. The temple will be important in our critical examination, but now for far more reasons than it would have been before. But more on that next time.